Good morning, everyone. I hope you're well today. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nell Wyman and Cynthia Russell from the Office of the Chief Medical Officer at the First Nations Health Authority. And they're gonna to talk to us today about taking care of our communities. Today, it's just one of us is, and we'll talk, tackle topics around ensuring the wellness of ourselves, our community members and caregivers during this time of physical distancing. Um, before we begin, I, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral unceded and occupied territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. I am coming to you from Quilacum or Nook Lelohem, or some of you know it as uh, Bowen Island. And I'm grateful to be here today on this beautiful day. As a quick reminder to everyone participating, uh, the topics we cover can often be sensitive, emotionally triggering, and of course, um, in this time, it, it might even be more so, acknowledging that. Please make sure that you are looking after yourself. Uh, for today, if you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, please don't hesitate to do so. We uh, also have a number on the Learning Circle website to call if you'd like to access further support. Um, before I turn the session over to our presenters, I'll introduce our Learning Circle team. My name is Leah Walker, and I'm of Danish, English, and Nakama ancestry with kinship and responsibilities to uh, Seabird Island. My role today is to be your facilitator and moderator. I will ensure that your questions are answered and your stories are shared from your chat box. Uh, the person that is usually in this place is Cole Daly, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, his work and him today. And I'd like to acknowledge behind the scenes, we have the very important support of our production coordinator, Cynthia Lung, and our work learn student, Kaylin Finnegan. So thank you both. We invite you, our online participants and community members, to introduce yourselves. Where are you from? Where are you located today? And um, ask questions and share what you know and observe in your community as part of this circle. Please do that in the chat box or in the question and answers. And now I'd like to turn it over to our guests. Uh, to introduce themselves and to start us off. Thanks, Cynthia. I guess I'll start. Um, Ani Bujou, everyone. Um, my name is Nell Wyman, um, originally from Little Grand Rapids First Nation in Manitoba. I'm a 60 Scoop survivor. Um, I'm a psychiatrist by training and spent more than 20 years doing clinical work until I moved to uh, Coast Salish territory with, where I now gratefully live, work and play. Um, and now I work for First Nations Health Authority as the Senior Medical Officer of Mental Health and Wellness in the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. So I'm really happy to be here with you and really happy to welcome my co-presenter today. I'll let her introduce herself. Um, and looking forward to having a really good discussion with people about issues of wellness um, at this time. Thanks. Thanks, Nell. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Cynthia Russell. I'm the clinical nurse specialist for mental health uh, uh, with the chief nursing office uh, at FNHA. Uh, I've been a nurse for 15 years and uh, working in mental health research and substance use. Uh, and I was um, uh, raised on Scrapmuck territory where my parents still live. Hi, mom and dad. 
And uh, my ancestry is settler and immigrant background, Scottish, German, and a little bit of West African. Uh, and I just wanted to say a shout out to my nursing colleagues also. This is the year of the nurse and the midwife. Uh, and man, what a, a year it's going to be. Uh, and thanks so much uh, to Nell and the CMO office for inviting me uh, to share this time with you and uh, share our ideas uh, with and along with uh, community members. Thanks. Okay. Um, so Cynthia and I didn't necessarily have a, a set agenda of, of, of things we wanted to cover. We really wanted this to be, to try as, to be as interactive as possible with people who are um, already sort of participating in on the chats. But I guess I just wanted to start with just a few comments and then maybe uh, we can, Cynthia and I can play off each other. And then maybe Leah, um, it looks like there are already about 10 people who um, uh, said something on the chat um, and we can sort of take it from there. We have about an hour and a half this morning and we'll see how that goes. So one of the things I think that we all, um, there's a couple of things that we all need to take into uh, account is uh, what are some of the ways that we can reduce the panic and the fear and the anxiety that we all feel uh, during this COVID-19 crisis? Um, you know, it's interesting right before, right before um, the pandemic hit, um, I actually, about a month before, was actually reading a book about the Spanish flu of 1918. And, you know, this sort of thinking that, you know, well, when is the next one going to come or when's the next one going to hit us? And then it finally, you know, dawns on me that, you know, actually it's already, it, it hit us, like it actually came. And so people naturally have um, a lot of anxiety about what's going on and especially in an ongoing way because there's gonna be no necessarily quick um, end to this. So I think it's really important for everybody listening um, and in your communities to recognize that this situation is stressful for everybody and that it's normal, even though I don't like using that word necessarily, to feel anxious and worried at times. Um, and we'll encourage people to try not to focus too much on the worst case scenarios because um, what we really need to do is to try to uh, stay um, stay within ourselves and look after the things that we can that we can do. So, for example, one of the things we can do is stay informed about the situation, but try not to track the news 24 seven or constantly be on social media. Um, you know, take some obviously lots of breaks for yourself from that um, and go to trusted news sources. And we can talk a, you know, a little bit about what that is. FNHA has a very good website. We've been putting out lots of external messaging. Uh, the BCCD, BCCDC has a great website, the Public Health Agency of Canada. And where I used to work when I lived in Ontario, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health has a whole section now on dealing with COVID-19. Um, so it's really important for people not to spread misinformation and go to, to these trusted news sources. And as I mentioned, part of the challenge I think for all of us is that things are rapidly changing with regard to the pandemic. And um, there almost seems to be sort of, day, you know, there's daily updates for sure, but also, you know, changing recommendations for example, the masks, um, the messaging on masks over the last day or two. So I think for a lot of people, this can feel a bit like losing control over things. And so it'll be important for us to remember, and we can come back to this later on, are the things that we do have control over that can make us feel a bit more reassured and less stressed. And then the things that we can't control and sort of learning to accept those and let it go to a certain extent. So I'll just stop there and maybe ask Cynthia if she wants to um, say any sort of opening uh, remarks. And then maybe Leah, I don't know if you, if there's some questions that have already come in. Thanks, Nell. Uh, I absolutely, you know, endorse everything that you've said and those are um, absolutely, um, 
great messages that will help all of us. Uh, I think uh, some other things that have been helpful for me and other people uh, and other nurses and community members that I've been in touch with uh, is um, also, you know, kind of recognizing the things I can control and the things I can't control, and then surrendering to the things I can't control and letting them go and doing practices like deep breathing and meditation and uh, really actively looking for ways to decrease anxiety. Uh, we can talk about that a little bit later as well. Um, and I really love what you said that this is this is a really unusual time. And we've heard that, you know, the term is unprecedented. It certainly is. Um, it's a really unusual time. And so we shouldn't judge ourselves or others by feeling anxious or feeling worried or feeling stressed. Because like you said, it's, it's a normal um, response to a really abnormal situation. And that, that doesn't mean we're weak. It doesn't mean we're not a good nurse or a good healthcare professional or a good mom or a good sister or auntie, a uh, good worker. Um, it just means that we are experiencing this along with everybody else. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing too, is to remember that we're not alone. Uh, not only are we not alone in our communities, but we're not alone in, in experiencing this pandemic situation. Uh, and that there is we don't know what it we don't know when the end of it will be but it will come to an end and we will have survived this uh, and hopefully thrived throughout it as well uh, and i think that's also something good to remember is what kinds of things can we do for ourselves and uh, our communities that will help us be better and help us feel better um, so that we can come out of the end of this feeling better or i mean i know there's lots of uh pressure out there to become a better person or to learn a new language and declutter and all these things. And I think sometimes if we can just get through and manage our stress and, you know, keep ourselves well and, you know, kind of get good sleep and manage the basics of that, that's also great. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and both, um, Dr. Nell, and did you want to say something more, um, Dr. Nell, before I? Um... No, I think uh, I see a lot of chat. I see a lot of chat messages coming in. So let's uh, maybe start a dialogue. That'd be great. Great. Thank you. Yes. And I, I just want to say I acknowledge um, there is um, there does seem to be a lot and uh, we place a lot of expectations on ourselves to perform. Um, at a really high standard and um you know the same stuff that you might do for yourself every day and then you do it in this environment and i think we kind of have to let ourselves off the hook a little bit right um i'm certainly hearing you say that um we don't have to learn a language <laughs> um we don't have to uh be a better person in all ways sometimes uh, we just have to be kind to ourselves so I'm going to um, share with you a question. There's some from um, the Northern Vancouver Island Regional Council from New Chalneth. Uh, Sabrina says, um, I feel the most part, those in the local community are practicing good social distancing practice. And I feel it's a great time for people to face their struggles head on and to learn and not just cope but to overcome so it's an opportunity to um really dig into all of the things that uh we know um that we're dealing with um so that was just a not a question but a, a statement but do you have anything to respond to around that well i I think the, the thing that it reminds me of is that, you know, we are asking people, uh, you know, probably the top public health me measure that we're being asked to do at this time is to physically distance from one another and to stay at home as much as possible. And, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can't stay connected to one another. Um, and I think that's the really important, uh, that's the really important thing. We, we, we have to come up with new creative ways of coming up together. I mean, some of them, some of us keep in touch with people um, in various ways. Like, you know, you know, a lot of my friends and family 
are in Ontario when I moved here to BC about two years ago. And so, you know, I've been able to keep in touch with people and my sister lives in Thunder Bay. So, you know, talking on the phone with her. So that's not necessarily a new way, but perhaps, you know, I feel that, you know, I've been, I've been keeping in, in better touch with people in some ways, really reaching out to people um, to make sure that they're okay, but also as, you know, sort of, uh, fulfilling for myself and helping me feel supported during this time. So, and I've heard all kinds of other stories of what's going on in communities um, in British Columbia, where people have stood out on their porches and have sang a song together or drum together. Um, so all of this to say that, you know, the physical distancing is really, really important. And we should try to do that as much as we can in order to flatten that curve. Um, which we are seeing some early encouraging signs of. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to be apart from one another. We can think of ways to stay connected and to be together, even though we can't be physically close to one another. I really like what Sabrina said around um, coping and that kind of reminds me of, you know, us building our resiliency and uh, mm -hmm. learning new ways of um, addressing the anxiety that we feel in this situation and maybe anxiety that we feel kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so I, I really like that about, you know, kind of thinking of intentional ways of um, helping us feel better and do better and um, uh, become more well without learning a new language, but becoming well and um, uh, more in balance and more, maybe more attuned because and now we have to be a little bit more intentional about our wellness. Hi, Chika, thank you. I have an amazing comment here um, and there's a lot of excellent comments in the chat box and questions. So I'd really thank um, all of our participants and um, to keep this coming, this is, uh, beautiful. We have a coordinator um, from the Nowakan Friendship Center in Dawson Creek who asks, our concern right now is helping the homeless and not having many facilities here for shelters. And so I imagine that it's quite a bit cooler in Dawson Creek as well. What is the best way we can provide services to these people right now? I have read the health guidelines for addictions and users, but how can we physically provide stations for use in the proper distancing methods? Cynthia, I'm just gonna ask if you want to comment initially, um, because uh, part of the role that I've been uh, playing the most part of uh, during this crisis is more on the external messaging, but. Maybe you've heard something from your nursing colleagues who are sort of more on the operational side of things. And then I can sort of fill in if I can. Uh, not knowing kind of what's happening in Dawson City, I think it was. Um, what I would do is I would reach out to the other um, service providers and also the town um, political uh, structure there and talk to them about um, how to meet these folks needs. Uh, I think every city has its, or every town has its own approach. Um, but thanks very much for considering this uh, population of folks that often gets left out of um, structures and systems and approaches. Uh, and definitely it's, it's significantly a concern. I think there's a, a different approach for every village and town and city. So I would recommend reaching out to the other folks who are there who are providing services and uh, for whom it's their responsibility, i.e. the, the city uh, uh, planners and politicians. Sorry, I can't be more specific, but um, every town kind of has its different approach. But definitely I am identifying that those folks um, are of need for special um, uh, special approaches and uh, uh, a special consideration is fantastic and it's a first step. Thanks. And I think, I think the only thing I'd, I'd add is to, you know, this reminds us all that, you know, the things that play into our health, um, the, the social and cultural determinants of health, um, 
impact people um, much greater, much more disproportionately. So we know, for example, you know, here in Vancouver on the downtown east side that Indigenous people are overrepresented amongst the population. And there are a lot of reasons why that is, including historical reasons and contemporary reasons and poverty, for example. So I know that, you know, there are some measures that are undertaken in each locale, um, you know, working with, with um, not only the governing, the governance structure in those, in those communities, but also with public health officials, um, say, for example, from each of the regions to try to mitigate the risk in some way, although we recognize that it's very difficult for people, um, for example, to, you know, adhere necessarily to things, the recommendations like the, the physical distancing and the frequent hand washing. Um, and I understand in, in the downtown east side that people are being provided, you know, with some supplies to do that, but recognizing the very real limitations um, that there exists for, for people who are homeless. And thank you for the question. Thank you for the answer. And I and I I guess what I'm hearing is that it's quite complex and um, you can't do it alone. You'll need to figure out how to work um, with other people to create um, the specifics in your community. And um, certainly we can learn from what's happening in other places and to do our best. And it could be really challenging because supplies are harder to get in some places. And so we're dealing with that as well. Um, I have, I'd like to point, um, I like the point of gathering info from trusted sources is a comment. So many people are being overwhelmed with conspiracy theories and not knowing who to trust. And of course, yes, the news and the webs can take us down all kinds of places. Um, how, and I think you've already mentioned that, um, and, and I know this will probably be mentioned again, but if we could uh, bring this home, how can we find firsthand resources which can be trusted and are up to date? I guess I can take a first, um, I can take a first try at that. So, you know, for, for, People in British Columbia, I think, you know, we are, we're fortunate in that we have a very robust public health system to start with that's managing this crisis, both provincially and regionally and in partnership with First Nations Health Authority. Um, I myself, because these are kind of busy times, I, I try to tune into the daily updates from um, the health minister and, of course, Dr. Bonnie Henry. Um, so that is a you know, she's a very trusted source of information and has been really, I think, a voice of calm and reassurance during these um, times that can be quite um, upsetting. Um, First Nations Health Authority, we have worked very hard uh, to provide information in a, a whole number of areas. So if you go to the website, uh, which is www.fnha.ca, um, you'll see um, information organized into different areas. So information for the public, information for health professionals, et cetera. And there, are, there, are, there is an FAQ section where you can, uh, there are a whole variety of uh, questions and answers there. But I think the only other thing I want to add right now is, you know, it is important uh, for people when you're sharing information, particularly on social media, to really try to find out where that source of that material is, is from, and that it is from a trusted source like, for example, the BCCDC or the Public Health Agency of Canada, places like that. I've seen a lot of information shared over the past three, four weeks. Um, one that's commonly circulated is a picture of someone leaning back with their throat and there's like these little sparkles and it's like, if you gargle with salt water for, I can't remember how long, um, you won't get COVID-19 is the essential message. And that is not true at all. And so I would just, you know, I have gone on and, and let people know that that's not true. That's not good information to be passing along. So, you know, if you know 
that it's not a trusted source and that it's not great information. I think we do all have a responsibility to make sure that the that just as we don't want to spread the virus to one another, we don't want to spread misinformation because as you say, it just starts a whole sort of vicious cycle of people um, um, you know, focusing on things that probably um, aren't um, valuable right now and there's much better things we could be doing with our time. Hi Chika for that, thank you for that answer. So the BC CDC is an excellent choice and we'll be posting um, some of these resources on our website for everyone as well. And of course the FNHA um, has been posting some amazing sources as well. Here is a question and I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are. How can we as frontline workers um, support emotionally and safely with regards to losses in our communities? In our culture, we are used to bringing and holding our family up during times of loss. Any thoughts about that? Um, I guess I'll start again. <laughs> um, yes, um, this is a really important area. Uh, and I think one, an area that we need to, um, again, think very carefully about and ensure that, you know, individual communities or nations um, create their own, uh, you know, sort of um, protocols that are um, suitable to this time that we're living in. So, for example, you know, the messaging has changed as the weeks have gone by as to the amount of Gap, you know, the amount of number of people that can be at gatherings. And right now, you know, we are recommending that there be no large gatherings of people um, at all and that people do stay at home. So that creates a dilemma for people, um, First Nations people and also people of other, um, um, you know, who have, who adhere to other uh, spiritual practices or religious practices because the way that we deal with, um, you know, serious illness or even in this case, loss or death of a person um, is going to have to change while we're currently living under these public health measures. And so I would, you know, even though um, it, it, there are elements that I think we need to be mindful of, and I don't want to take up too much time, but to say that, you know, I think, um, because of the because of the events of the past in terms of our ceremonial or cultural practices being actually legislated against and also people's poor past and current poor treatment in these various systems like hospitals for example um, there is this you know sort of it, it it those of us you know who have intergenerational trauma or even contemporary trauma and have live with chronic trauma, that, that kind of raises feelings within us that, you know, sort of we're being told what to do yet again. Um, and it's hard to sort of make that bridge into we're, we ha we're having to do these right now to, to protect our ourselves and our families and our loved ones and our communities and our nations. So even though people are being asked to, um, you know, either postpone um, a ceremony um, or or change it in some way um, you know I've heard of um, gatherings taking place that take place over um, you know FaceTime or WhatsApp um, or just having a, an extremely extremely small uh, group like immediate family maintaining that physical distance and then planning on something um, for down the road uh, because, you know, there is going to be an after to this at some point. We don't really know when that is uh, as of yet. Uh, but there is going to be a time where we will be able to come together again. And I think the focus right now um, as well should be on, you know, each and every one of us uh, doing what we can to 
um, protect ourselves and our health and wellness and, you know, and, and in doing that, protecting our loved ones and our community members. And uh, just to kind of add on to that around recognizing the individuals who are experiencing loss and grief and uh, distress, um, that this is a time for communities to come together wherever, whatever your community is and wherever your community is, but check in with the people uh, from a distance um, that you think might need, be needing some extra support, some extra check-ins. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for communities to, you know, when we think of historically around practices that were banned, um, but this is communities coming together to keep themselves uh, protected and well and protecting vulnerable and precious people um, to make a plan for the future and kind of taking that power and empowering um, themselves it's not really a right, right way to put it, around making a plan for the future when this is done uh, to honor spirit and honor the loved ones who have gone ahead um, so that it doesn't feel powerless, so it doesn't feel um, like a loss that, that isn't recognized. Um, and yeah, recognizing that these are temporary times, these are stressful times, there's lots of unknown, but it will come to an end. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I've heard lots of people have shared with me around how they've adjusted ceremony, whether they're doing ceremony um, solo by themselves or with their family members in their house, with the ones who live with them, or by FaceTime, or by Zoom, or uh, Skype. Uh, and uh, it's just that another layer of innovation uh, that has um, created resiliency and um, uh, have communities and cultures that have last, lasted since the dawn of time? Good question. Uh, a really good question. And um, thank you for those answers and particularly finding innovative ways um, to do ceremony and grounding and supporting um, our wellness and some of our traditions. So I've been really inspired by some of the elders. I have the privilege of um, working with and who support our community as well. And um, we've been sharing ceremonial practices via text and then deciding at a certain time to have a ceremony, so a smudge or um, a meditation at a certain time, and we've all done it separately in our own spaces. So um, it's been great to know um, that has been there. So if there is a way, I guess, to support our knowledge keepers and elders to be able to communicate in that way, mm -hmm. um, that would be a really beautiful gift um, for everybody to be able to um, participate. And so that might mean <laughs> um, supporting our elders and knowledge keepers in, um, in figuring out the technology because we're all becoming um, better at that. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for that. And I just also wanted to say one more thing, and then um, um, Nell, I think I see you wanting to say something or adding, because I think there's some stories around this. Um, one um, person um, acknowledged that participating in a sweat lodge, um, there's information going around that participating in the sweat lodge will kill the virus. So how do we address things like that? So our ceremonies, might not be perfectly healthy in this time. Right. So just to follow up on that particular example, um, at the present time, the recommendation is that we not um, hold sweat lodges. Um, it, it's important for people to know, and you know, and I don't mean this to sound like, like I'm being authoritarian, but uh, we really want to do everything that we can to stop the spread of this virus um, and to slow it down. So, yeah, I saw, I actually saw a Facebook post or it was um, 
brought to brought to our attention in, in the office of the chief medical officer that someone was um, openly uh, advertising a sweat uh, ceremony coming up. I think it was over the weekend, last weekend. And, you know, first of all, you know, one of the major issues with that is it's bringing people uh, with close to each other um, and people are not, um, uh, you know, it's not adhering to the, the physical distancing rule of keeping at least six feet apart. Um, and then, uh, you know, the virus is spread by droplets. Um, and so they, you know, when we sneeze or we cough, it comes out of our, out of our bodies. And the same, we've had some discussion around this, the same can happen when you're singing really loudly. Um, and, and if you've ever seen a picture of someone singing in a concert with their light lit up, you can see, actually see people, you know, spit coming out of people's mouths. So that's one issue. And the other issue around the heat is, um, you know, we don't know, um, you know, we don't know how, the, how long or under what conditions necessarily that this virus can survive in places, in, in places like that. So we, you know, this virus has, you know, been present in communities that are very, or countries that are very warm and temperate right now. So not just like us in the Northern Hemisphere where we're entering sort of, you know, spring. Um, it has been present in countries in the Southern Hemisphere where the temperatures are quite warm and it, yet it has spread and continues to affect um, those countries. So I don't think the sort of heat reason um, is a good enough reason to say, oh, I'm protected if I go into a sweat lodge. So it, you know, we're, we're very much um, erring on the side of caution and just recommending to people that they not uh, participate in those um, ceremonies right at this time. Thank you, Heichka, for that. I do know um, a certain elder who does solo um, sweat lodges, so that's possible, I mm -hmm. would imagine. All right. <laughs> Sorry, Leah, just to follow up on that, I think, you know, you made the point a couple minutes ago that, um, you know, there does, there is a bit of, you know, a, we're going to have to be a little bit creative for the next while about things that we can do that are uh, ceremony. So I really like the idea of people arranging to do something at a certain time together, even though they're not physically together. But they're connected. Um, I have a, a really good friend of mine right now who's, um, you know, has been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And we had a prayer circle for her across the world, literally, um, all at a certain time and on a certain day, uh, where we were asked to sit quietly and, and, and visualize her uh, being healthy and well and, and whole again. And, you know, it was very powerful to do that. So I think we have to sort of, you know, accept that things aren't quite, you know, things are definitely not the way they were a month or two ago. Uh, but there are things that we can do that can be deeply meaningful um, and helpful for nurturing spirit and helping us maintain that emotional uh, wellness, even though we might have to do things a little bit differently for the next while. Um, there's so many um, beautiful thoughts and comments that are coming from all of you online, and I would encourage you um, to do so, to keep um, sharing those thoughts, those questions, and stories about what you are seeing that looks, that you can share with others around um, how we can take care of each other during this time. I have a question here from um, Rose Austin. She says, um, and you might have already addressed it, but I'd like to uh, bring it again. How do we encourage those who are feeling very depressed about being isolated from their families? Fear is at an all-time highs. I think we've talked about this as well. 
because of social media, which may not be reliable. And also um, just being in this intense time of lockdown feels very um, difficult and, you know, your and um, communities are following orders and um, some councils are saying, yes, we lock down. And so of course um, it brings up all kinds of things um, for people. So do you have anything more to add about um, Rose's question? So I think, sorry, I guess I'll start. <laughs> sorry, Cynthia. Um, I, I think this is a good time for us to remember that uh, it goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning about this, uh, you know, fear and anxiety and stress comes from this loss of control. You know, things have dramatically changed for us. Um, and it, there's a period of time where we have all needed to adjust to uh, the circumstances that we're currently living under. And for some people that takes longer than others. And, you know, it's sort of, uh, I was thinking about this the other day that, you know, when I worked clinically as a psychiatrist, you know, people would present with quite, you know, quite severe depressive symptoms at times that would, that were only there for a, sh you know, relatively short period of time. And by that, I mean weeks. And so we would call that an adjustment disorder. And, and someone didn't go on to develop the full major depressive episode. Um, and so it made me think, even though, you know, I'm a psychiatrist myself, I had to realize this last week where I was thinking, you know, we are all in the middle of having an adjustment disorder because things have changed so much. So it, I think for myself, it, it goes back to things that we do have control over, that we can, that we have some say in. And someone actually, this was one of the most excellent things that was shared on Facebook uh, the last couple of days. And I'm really sorry, I can't remember the name of the fellow who uh, his post would belong to, but it was a depiction of a me medicine wheel with the four aspects, mental, men physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual, and activities listed in each of those you know, aspects about things that we do have control over and that we can do for ourselves. So physically, for example, you know, it was, you know, uh, adhere to the public health measures like the physical distancing, washing your hands frequently, uh, but other things like going for a walk outside, um, take a bath that might be relaxing for you, um, try to stay active, uh, eat a good, you know, eat a healthy meal if you're able to and stay hydrated, try to get enough sleep, um, and do things like, you know, yoga or stretching uh, at home. And there's all kinds of, if you, you know, Google this or go on YouTube, you can find all sorts of things in that area for free and, and mentally um, do things like, you know, try to read a book instead of being online all the time. Um, practice deep breathing. Uh, again, there are some very good meditation apps that are available and also free meditation uh, videos and things on YouTube. Um, and we talked about not, not Cynthia and I don't have time to learn a new language, but learning how to do something new to challenge yourself. Um, and the other thing is like things like positive self-talk. So that sounds a bit jargony, but it's just, it's reassuring yourself that you're okay. You're going to be okay. You can take, there are things that are within your control, just sort of keeping that inner dialogue uh, positive. On the emotional side, just things like calling a loved one, writing in a journal, uh, look for things that are humorous. I mean, that is like one of our greatest strengths, I think, as Indigenous people is our ability to appreciate humor despite all the adversity that we've been through. Um, and then spiritually, we've talked a little bit more about smudging, uh, being in nature, um, being able to go outside um, and uh, you know, learning more about, about our culture or our ceremonies um, as best we can uh, at this time. And especially if we are able to make sure that elders and knowledge keepers can be connected with us, um, that, would be, that would be a good idea. Um, thanks, Nell. Um, 
just to kind of tag along to what you said, uh, I also like the idea <clears throat> that this is a pause um, right now be and we'll resume things later. Um, and uh, things that I've heard also that can be really helpful, this is from multiple sources, like for example, uh, Commander Hatfield, who's our Canadian astronaut, and he said he knows a few things about isolation. And uh, he was, I don't know if anyone saw him, he was on TV the other day, and, and he said, you know, his number one thing um, to help his joys be, or his days be more enjoyable and to help him cope with this isolation of being in a tin can in the middle of space um, was to be creative. And he has his guitar with him all the time and sings. And so he really, you know, encouraged all of us to find some ways to be creative. Uh, and I know in our communities, we have very creative aunties and grandmothers and moms, and we can really learn from them at this time. And if they're close by, maybe we can learn some of those traditional crafts that they are so fantastic at um, and that they know uh, is very soothing uh, or maybe we have a Skype meetup where we learn some crafts or we craft together or something like that um, and some other things that have been recommended by people who live in submarines and astronauts and people who spend a lot of time in isolation things like um, having a routine to your day so even if it's not typical for you to be at home all day, maybe you don't work from home or maybe you're out and about, but now you've had to stay at home. So really intentionally create a routine in your day, um, which includes self-care, which includes self-maintenance, uh, good foods, and some of those traditional teas that are very, you know, um, health supporting. Um, and around reaching out to loved ones, uh, maybe people we haven't talked to in a while, call them, write them. Maybe, you know, the art of letter writing will be, you know, rejuvenated. Um, I remember before internet, we used to write a lot of letters. Uh, and, uh, and I love the humor um, that absolutely will, you know, you know, be one of the things that really brings us through. Um, and Nell, um, you had told me something that your partner did uh, in his um, <laughs> rest purchasing around this time. Do you want to share with us? <laughs> you know, I think, yeah, we've talked a little bit about, I think, how humor can really get us through these times. Uh, and, you know, I think for myself, I'll know that I'm not managing my stress level well when I lose the ability to laugh and find things um, ridiculous. So, you know, and I know that all of us wear our anxiety a little bit differently. Um, for myself, I know that I like to organize things and clean things and, you know, Swiffer the apartment uh, a million times a day because that sort of lowers my level of anxiety. And my partner has been um, not hoarding in any way, but just particular items that he thinks we might need. And and when we first, you know, heard about the staying at home rule, we thought, what's the first thing that we need? And we both looked at each other and it wasn't toilet paper. It was coffee. <laughs> and so he went out and bought about half a dozen cans of evaporated milk, thinking that, I don't know, somehow we'd run out of milk or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> I've never owned a can of evaporated milk in my entire life. So I'm not sure what we're going to do with it when... Um, we haven't had to break into our supply yet, um, but I'm sure there's some good recipes out there that involve evaporated milk. So I'll have to look into that uh, later on. Uh, there's a online, there's a hashtag, and I think it's called, is it called quarantine recipes or something? Where people are digging into their pantries and coming up with these great recipes to share with each other. So maybe that's something that communities can do too is, um, sharing recipes and you know or traditional recipes that we haven't made in a while um, dusting up our you know grandmother's cookbooks or auntie's bannock recipe that we uh, have mm. been paying attention to and that yeah. would you know help us feel particularly well at this point the other site that i think a lot of people are tuning into that can be really helpful is um it's called social distance powwow um, and it, you know, at the beginning, it was a lot of people showing themselves, you know, dancing and 
um, you know, a million adorable young children in their traditional regalia. And it's turned a little bit into a tribute to healthcare workers from who are indigenous from mostly it seems like Canada and the US, but um, you know, they, there are other, there are other links like that, that are very similar. A, a colleague that I work with in on the wellness team in the OCMO has um, uh, signed up for, uh, I think it's like powwow fitness dancing uh, classes. Um, so you can also find those online as well. Oh, I love that. I'd be totally mm. into that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I thank you so much for all of your uh, suggestions. It just brings up so much. I know that there must be um, all over the world. There's a lot of people learning how to bake bread, right? <laughs> yeah. I heard there was a shortage of yeast. <laughs> it's true. So I guess it's sourdough and you can make home dough, um, your own homemade sourdough for sure. It's pretty funny. Um, I wanted to share a few comments from some of our community members um, on here and um, there's been some really great comments and I hold my hands up to all of you that are participating. Uh, I want to share from um, the Kasli Watin that um, their nation has been addressing members with updates and best practices on Facebook Live. And so they're doing that yeah. um, with their community. And um, I think that's really fantastic. And one of their counselors addressed um, Nikazi Dalkit for the um, elders. So I just think that's amazing that um, the community has created that um, opportunity. And I just want to share a couple of other things that are coming up on the feed. And then I have a, probably a couple more questions. Um, certainly, there are Indigenous students at UVic and um, VIU um, that are filled with anxiety and uncertainty and um, heartfelt collaborating and connecting is at an all-time high is what they're noticing. So that's really good. And I'm certainly... Um, noticed that with Indigenous students at UBC too. So I think, um, and I imagine that um, other communities of people um, finding ways to connect, right? Like, cause I notice for myself actually, because I have been so insular in my space and I'm normally a very um, external kind of person that I noticed that my behavior has changed and I've become um, personally more distant when I do go out for a walk. And um, I, I just noticed that my behavior has changed quite a bit. And I find that really interesting. Uh, I, I really, that really resonates with me too when I go out for a walk and spend my time weaving onto yeah. the road, onto the sidewalk in order not to encounter somebody else's bubble. Um, and, but it also makes me, you know, think of this, maybe the gift that COVID can bring us is the partnerships that address many of the gaps that had been in our systems or our relationships or our settings uh and maybe this is um yeah that uh the one thing is this increased relationships and connections and systems and addressing you know and i think of some of the healthcare gaps that have you know very quickly um moved into place to address the gaps and also highlighted gaps that continue to exist and i think you know, the other thing that I would add is, you know, we're advising, you know, people to work on their personal wellness and, you know, say wellness as a, a family or, you know, a group of people who are living uh, in the same home. But, you know, many of us, I think, feel uplifted by helping other people. And, you know, first, like, as a very common baseline, like I had a friend on Facebook who said, oh, you know, you're, you, you, you guys seem so busy and you're working so hard and here I am at home and, and, you know, all I'm being asked to do is lay on the couch and watch Netflix. 
But I wrote back and I said, you know, no, what you're actually doing is you are actively participating in stopping to spread this virus by staying home and practicing physical distancing. So you are an active participant. And, you know, a lot of people we find, you know, we find it fulfilling to be helpful to other people. So there are, you know, firstly, within communities, there, there probably are opportunities to help out each other in different ways. You know, if you're going to the grocery store, um, pick up something that you think, you know, if you can connect over, you know, either by text message or, or somehow, if there are people who are um, less able to go do those things, uh, to pick up some food items for people and leave them on their doorstep or whatever, there's, you know, I don't want to necessarily be pros proscriptive, but you know, there are ways that we can help out each other. Um, and, you know, for students, I have to say my heart goes out to students of all different types, you know, people who are at colleges and trade schools and uh, universities, um, because many people's studies has shifted online and programs are ending at different times and that weren't expected and things like that. So, um, there are activities that students can get involved in as well. Um, if you go to the FNHA uh, website, we uh, have asked students to participate in a, a public health movement and sort of be public health champions in their communities. Um, and then also I heard on a phone call a couple of days ago that because of British Columbia's response to COVID-19, that they are looking for people uh, to help uh, do contact tracing. Um, and I don't know specifically, we'd have to maybe look up where the contact person or contact organization would be. I would imagine it would be the Provincial Health Authority. But, um, you know, if you are, if you have some time on your hands and you want to um, help other people, there are things that you can do from the safety of staying home um, and yet still sort of contribute to um, some positive things that are going on that um, can help get us through this uh, together. Absolutely. Uh, and on a, just what you were talking about around uh, that each individual person has a role to play uh, and that, we're, you know, we're all in this together. And it reminds me of the seven o'clock um, big cheer that is kind of going around the mm. world. Um, but in the bigger cities, you can really hear it. And I think smaller places are doing it, too. Uh, and I heard that community members are doing it from their uh, front doors with their drums, uh, the, dr the drumming and the cheering and the honking and, and pot banging at seven o'clock, which um, it, it originally was to kind of acknowledge and thank healthcare providers, um, also uh, first responders. Um, and those who are doing essential work to keep us all well. Um, but, you know, it also makes me feel like it, it's a couple of minutes where we all of us acknowledge being in this together and having this moment of fun and joy. And it's you know kind of one of those things you can look forward to at the end of the day. Um, and it really kind of brings home that we are all in this together. And when I think about talking to my friends who live overseas, you know, it's one of the one things that we in every country of the world are experiencing at the same time. Um, that is this really unusual event um, and how envisioning us ourselves as part of this global community um, and also kind of acknowledging that and having a bit of fun together with it um, is kind of a good way to think about that and, and to lift our spirits mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Yeah, I agree. I find it very moving actually to hear everybody cheering and making noise uh, together. Um, Thea, you're on mute. Sorry, I agree both of you. Gosh, um, I agree both of you um, how coming together at seven o'clock, it's really um, fantastic. But I also just appreciate um, listening to your positive energy. Both of you just really brings me up and um yeah it's, it's just beautiful to hear i'm wondering um and i also just wanted to acknowledge uh some of the 
potential volunteer works, even if you don't have a lot of time. I've seen a lot, um, certainly with medical students, for example, indigenous medical students that have had their um, their schooling interrupted and had to change mm. drastically. Um, they've all come to the fore and are supporting um, people with triaging at for the hospitals, certainly in the Lower Mainland and other places. And I know um, for those of you out there that um, are interested in doing some volunteer, I know that there's some hotlines um, and um, volunteer online work for organizations like Atira and others um, where they're looking for support, even just for an hour or two a day. So um, I just want to acknowledge that statement as well. I have a question um, around um, we are seeing, you know, with us all being um, locked in our houses, so to speak, or at least um, contributing to the well being of everyone there, um, certainly increased stress. Um, I certainly notice that um, it's easy for me to get very upset with my husband which is <laughs> just to be um, honest about that and irritated and I realize it's not him it's just um I'm listening to stress in my environment and certainly some of your um, tips are really great but I also want to acknowledge that for some people that might not be seeing the bigger picture and um, those that might be experiencing um, harm at home perhaps um do you have any thoughts around that about what you're seeing and and um, ways that we can support people that might be in that situation in this time right yeah no this is you know this is um a really important topic um that spreads out in a couple of different ways so you know we have heard um reports not just within British Columbia or within Canada but just you know in the different countries that uh, the unfortunately the rates of domestic violence or intimate partner violence um, there seems to be an, uh, an uptick in um, in that happening and we actually I'm so lucky in at FNHA uh, to work with another physician Dr. Anjali Malotra and she and I, what I would do for detailed recommendations is advise people who are on this, uh, within this learning circle to go to the FNHA webpage, uh, website and check out the post that we did. Um, that's called when staying home is not safe. Um, and we did, we chose the title specifically because the, the advice, you know, is to stay home, stay home, stay home. But what do you do in the situation where, it's not safe. So if you can go to our website and find that article at the bottom, there are a whole number of recommendations. And one, of course, is to, uh, you know, if you are able to, if you are someone who's experiencing domestic violence, to reach out. Um, if, if you are not able, like if your phone is being controlled or you don't have access to call um, any of these lines, um, or your, uh, you know, social services within your community, um, you can ask a friend, uh, you can try to ask a friend for help, uh, or even, um, you know, try to make contact with someone, a, a provider in your community. And now a lot of the service agencies have switched, un or not unfortunately, but they've had to switch to, you know, one-on-one -on -one phone consultation or uh, initially making contact online. Again, the other area that we haven't really touched on today, and it's making me think that, you know, the time has, is going by so quickly. There's so much to talk about. Uh, hopefully we can come back and, and do it, do this again. Uh, but there are some, you know, there are some very good resources available uh, in terms of people who are experiencing mental health crises overall. Um, so, for example, the Kuis crisis line and that number, um, I think, has been, you know, is available widely. Um, I also looked at a very good post from the BC Division of the Canadian Mental Health Association uh, so that you can uh, email them at help at cmha.bc.ca. 
Um, and then there's the kids help phone as well. Um, and there have been, I think, calls for uh, specifically for people to man um, phones uh, in areas where there are significant indigenous populations so that there's that cultural safety piece built into it as well. So there are, like I said, some very good resources available to people and we shouldn't, um, you know, we shouldn't necessarily um, assume that, you know, we're in a crisis and everyone's just kind of getting on with it and managing because some people are having some really challenging times. And B, I, I, I do like what you said about, um, you know, that you yourself were feeling in certain ways at certain times. And all of us are going through that. Um, definitely, I have days where I feel very motivated and sort of, uh, you know, able to really focus on the work that I have to do. And like yesterday, honestly, was my the worst day that I've had in the last three and a half weeks. Like I just I couldn't get something very mild to happen with my computer and I just had a complete meltdown. Um, and then I found myself in tears, like on, honestly, like near tears almost every single time something minor happened in my day and I just sort of finished the day and I went, oh my God, I'm so glad today's over. And, and I did wake up, I slept a bit better last night and I feel better today. So, um, you know, if people are in real crises, there are resources available like we talked about. Um, and but also in general to prevent people necessarily on their way up to building up to a crisis, it's important to engage in some of those coping mechanisms that we talked about earlier, sort of that very holistic view of things you can do to, um, you know, bring that at, you know, that anxiety level down. Uh, because we all, it all comes out in different ways. Like, you know, I've, I've been ir irritable um, sometimes um, with my partner as well. And it just, you know, we're, we're a team and we're trying to get through this together. And some days, you know, I'm able to kind of, you know, bear most of the weight or whatever, the emotional weight of this. And at other times I'm not in a good mood and he's kind of doing something to, per you know, to perk us up. So, um, yeah, just like Cynthia said, we're all in this together um, and being having that being able to hold that space for yourself and recognizing your emotions and then also being very gentle and kind with yourself um, that these, you know, this is this is this is us living through what we're currently living through, which is a pandemic. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to say a couple of add on things um, that just to also remember that the Kuis, uh crisis response line, um, which is 1-800-588-8717, um, is also a support line. So even if you need someone to talk to, or you know someone needs someone to talk to, to help alleviate any kind of mental health distress or stress in general, or deep, deep loneliness, you can reach out to them as well. You don't have to feel like you're at an absolute crisis uh, to get some support from KUIS. There, it's a great line, um, and uh, definitely there's you know, great people on the end of that line to help you out. Um, and also, you know, if you're, if you recognize that someone may be, you know, at risk for violence or coming in harm's way, don't hesitate to reach out to them um, and, you know, connect with them and see what you can do. That might be, make the difference to know, for them to know that they're not alone and to help connect them with resources that they need. I and uh, I was you. just, thanks. I was just, um, I read this, uh, I don't know if I saw a YouTube video or whatever, this, this submarine captain who had some ideas about how to live in close quarters with people. Uh, and the other thing he said, now you kind of reminded me of this around kind of de-escalating the daily stressors that kind of get in your way of being, you know, living in close quarters with someone is just kind of nip that in the butt and, uh, you know, what, how in whatever way you can, finding a little spot for yourself, a little kind of space for yourself um, to just give yourself a bit of space from each other. I know it's often hard when uh, families are living together in quarters that they're not used to all being together at, at one time. Um, so 
I don't necessarily want to make light of that, but uh, just to add some more things to the conversation. Well, I think it's, you know, like we, we were talking about, we talk about this a lot uh, is, you know, how we do use humor as a coping mechanism. Like, honestly, like sometimes it feels so heavy when, you know, you, you're, you're tuned into the news and what's going on that humor is, you know, I think it's so helpful. Like I, I saw a silly little dog video this morning on my phone and it actually made me smile. And I thought, wow, I haven't really felt that big smile on my face for a little while. Um, and sort of from a humorous side, Leah, you might find this, you might find this funny that, you know, now that I'm at home working and I'm sitting here at this, my dining room table for hours and hours, at least Monday to Friday, my partner is a freelancer. So he usually eats his breakfast brunch on the couch right beside me. And I started to wonder whether, you know, eating noises, loud eating noises was a symptom of COVID because I don't remember him being that loud before. It's just all this like slurping and eating on the spoon. And I was just like, oh my God, please give me patience to just survive, you know, him for the next 15 minutes without saying something really sharp because it's just so grating. So um, yeah, we all have to kind of, try to find the humor in things like that. Like I said, I think at the beginning, I think once I know if my sense of humor is sort of leaving me, then I know that I have to really take stock of where I'm at. So in my wellness, um, but there's, and there's lots of really, there's really some really funny, you know, indigenous comedians online and things like that, you know, just to really lighten it up for a bit. I've, I have to really resist because I live in an apartment in Vancouver and I have to really resist becoming one of those get off my lawn people, you know, looking outside like, are those two people living together? Should they be walking so close together? What are those people standing outside talking for? <laughs> Crazy things that we wouldn't yeah. ever care about. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring up a couple of questions because sorry I didn't get to this question earlier, um, and it could be that it's on on the FNHA website, but I wanted to make sure that was the case. Um, someone asked they're looking for support in their isolated communities. So um, for for instance. Um, there's home gatherings where people might be consuming alcohol or whatever, or some of the youth are coming together and they're not up to date with social distancing. And so they might need um, some resources to share that message. So are there posters or things that people can download to post in their communities around that that are um, Indigenous specific and focused? Uh, we have a fair amount of resources on the FNHA COVID website uh, in all of the different categories, but there's some pretty good infographics that have been produced um, that help people really understand the positive consequences of social distancing. Um, and I think there's a fair amount of ideas about, you know, what to do at home. And um, I know that youth, uh, may struggle in some communities because they're you know the natural way of being a young person is being in you know a social group um however if they can text and all that kind of thing that that makes it a big difference um but it certainly uh, might be communities coming together and not physically coming together but coming together as leaders and as uh quiet helpers and as communities and families uh, how they troubleshoot um or how they co-learn um, different ways of being social and supporting each other at this time. Good question though. I know um, that there uh, is a meeting that's coming up that uh, we're going to be talking about some of these issues about people um, who for whatever reason, you know, are not necessarily paying attention to the physical distancing rules, getting together, having parties, things like that. Um, we're in the process of developing a message for young people, um, not to um, 
you know, center them out and saying, oh, because you're young and you're not listening, that kind of thing. We don't want it to be like that. We want it to be, you know, a, a message of like, we are all in this, like literally together and we each have a part to play. Um, and so what we're doing, I think, uh, right now is we're trying to find some young people who can, one or two young people who can participate in helping us create this message. Because obviously it's it's sort of like, you know, the, the you know, the Nancy Reagan or whatever uh, thing of the past. Like if I, you know, sit there and I go, don't spend time together and shake my finger like the older lady that I am. I mean, that's not really going to be relatable. So um, I think what we want to do is appeal to people's uh, sense of altruism that, you know, we, you know, the people, some of the people in our communities who are most at risk, including our elders, our knowledge keepers, our older people who may happen to have chronic medical illnesses like, you know, heart disease or diabetes, lung disease, um, and people who may be differently abled. We want to protect the resources of our community, the human resources. And so we all have a role to play in that. So I would advise, you know, I'd people to look out for that messaging. Hopefully that'll come out in the next week or so. Um, but it's, it has to be sort of, you know, done trying to help people um, change or alter their behavior. You have to come at it in a way that's not blaming or shaming. And also, um, you know, it makes me, when I see like, it was like Cynthia was saying, yelling off her balcony at people. Like I still see the odd person, people, groups of people not paying attention. And I feel like it happened to me on Sunday while we were out for a walk. And um, I had to think about it for a minute about, first of all, I don't want to provoke a confrontation that I don't want to deal with. Um, but secondly, it made me think like, why why is that person not adhering to the physical distancing rule, right? And they're probably um, not, um, I, I highly doubt that they haven't heard a news broadcast or something in the last three weeks, so they're completely unaware of physical distancing. But I think it's, in their case, it may be because they're so anxious or so stressed out that they don't, they're in that denial phase where like, you know, this isn't really happening. So I'm just going to behave as I normally do or that defiant sort of mode, right? Where no one's going to tell me what to do. I'm just going to do whatever I want. So it's, it's important, I think, to think, to not be blaming and shaming and to try to understand that person's perspective. Um, in our communities, I think we can be a bit, in smaller communities, we can be a bit more upfront with each other about, you know, hey, Cynthia, why aren't you doing that? But like out in public in a bigger urban place, I'm not so sure I would actually take people on. Um, you know, again, it comes down to that control. There's things I can do to control and there's things that are out of my control and I can't let it kind of, you know, uh, affect me emotionally because I'm, I'm so busy trying to make sure that I'm okay myself. Hi, Chika, thank you for that. Um, with regard to maybe the youth messaging, there was just a beautiful comment on here. Um, what maybe the question is what this being a warrior, um, mm. being or warrior training for youth during them, like how do they step into their roles as warriors, as youth? So it was just a comment there. Yeah. Um, a very important question, and maybe um, you don't have the the complete answer, but it's been asked a few times now is, um, are there, or do you know if there will be testing kits um, available in our communities or that people will be able to access? And is this something, this kind of screen that we should be doing in our communities? Um. So that particular question, I think right now we, um, as I said, I'm not on the operations side. Uh, next week, um, uh, Dr. Evan Adams, the chief medical officer, is going to be on this learning circle. So he would be an excellent person to ask that question of. Um, but um, for now, I think we are, you know, we are trying to align ourselves and be consistent with the recommendations around testing in the province. 
So we're not testing every single person. Um, you know, we're the, the people that are prioritized right now are the people who come into, you know, emergency rooms with symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, our healthcare workers. Um, we are not testing cases of people who are, you know, maybe sick at home, having milder or moderate versions of a cold or a flu or COVID-19, we don't necessarily know, but if they're having milder symptoms, they stay at home and the advice is to, you know, self-isolate yourself 14 days. Um, so you may not necessarily be counted in the test. But I think, you know, again, this is a question that people have around uh, that, that relates to people's anxieties about the not knowing, right? And I think, um, you know, what we need to do is to... Um, is to pay attention to that about why these questions come up. People want to know because they feel anxious that that somehow might be reassuring for them to know either that they're, you know, that they're negative probably in the most case, but you know, that's not necessarily the best use of the resources that we have right now. So we are, you know, we're following the direction of Dr. Bonnie Henry um, and the public health system in British Columbia and following that protocol. Cynthia, I don't know if you have anything to add necessarily. Oh, just that the FNHA website on the COVID-19 information, there's a ton of information there around, I think there is information around testing. Um, our communicable disease department um, in nursing services is doing an amazing job with that information and around PPE and have a look there. There's a ton, ton, ton of information and also for community leaders and um, going to answer as many questions that, that folks have around that. Aichika, thank you. Um, there are so many questions and I don't know if we'll get to them all. So I just want everyone to know um, that there is going to be a session next Tuesday from this office with Dr. Evan Adams and I think Jordy Johnson, perhaps mm -hmm. other guests. So this will be an opportunity for us to gather um, to um, have some of those questions answered that we don't get to. Um, Here's a question, and perhaps it's about sharing some of what you do and the audience per, perhaps as well, um, or our participation, our participants in this. And um, the question is, are there any suggestions for traditional grounding techniques? Is there something that you do? I certainly know that... Um, I, 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 for myself, ground myself to Mother Earth, no matter what, even in my home, I know that I'm um, connected. And um, when I am able to even to sit on the land um, for a moment and taking a deep breath and, and um, connecting, that's one of the ways that I very quickly ground myself um, to Mother Earth. And I'm wondering um, if you have any other thoughts around traditional grounding techniques that's um for me i traditional i don't know maybe it's even worldwide but um an elder had taught me so um anything dr nell or cynthia yeah i mean i think um you know there are so many things um and i again it's going to be different for different people and different nations um, so for myself, um, one of the things I find very grounding is to smudge. Um, although I do have to be kind of careful because I live here in a in an apartment building. Um, so far, I haven't put out the fire. I haven't put off the fire alarms. Um, but I think you know when our minds get really busy, it can be really helpful to engage our other senses in traditional ways. So the you know, the act of smudging, but just that scent of the sage and, um, you know, sort of concentrating on that ceremony is extremely, you know, not just grounding, but healing. Another thing that I have done uh, a couple times over the past few weeks is when I have uh, gone out uh, to a larger park, uh, I found some cedar on the ground. 
um, and brought it home and made a tea uh, or boiled it in some water and on the stove and just that scent of cedar throughout the house, which also is supposed to be cleansing. Uh, but it just, you know, if you focus just for a minute, instead of your mind going around like a wheel um, uh, and on the scent of the cedar and, and then say, you know, some prayers. Uh, so, you know, as you mentioned, you know, there's people who, um, you know, just feeling the ground, um, touching trees if they're nearby. Um, I have an, I had an elder who told me that every time I walk, because I always take pictures, I love to take pictures. And I like to take pictures of these big, tall trees. And she said to me, you know, you should touch those trees, like be a tree hugger. And I never really, you know, I never really did that before, honestly, to go, I don't necessarily give it a full on hug, but, you know, to sort of lay my hands on that tree and try to feel the, the living presence of, of all the creatures, you know, from big to small and from underneath the ground all the way up uh, and appreciate uh, the beings of the sky. So I think there's lots of things that we can do that um, are, you know, can either go, you know, last momentarily or go on for a while. Like uh, last week, I was in, I actually was in the office um, and, and, and Dr. Evan Adams was in at the same time and we were chatting and kind of laughing a little bit. And then we looked out the window, we're in West Vancouver, and there was an eagle flying around outside. So even just taking a look out the window and noticing it in the first place, but then just watching for, you know, 15 or 20 seconds and taking in the awe of an eagle in flight, I found very, very grounding um, and reminded me that we're doing, we're trying our best to do good work. Thank you for that, um, Nell. We are coming to um, an end of our circle today. So um, I want to extend my appreciation to you, both of you, for your um, wisdom and joy, and um, as well as your very good advice for all of us. So it's been um, wonderful just um, to be in your presence, even um, through our screens. And I am also uh, very grateful for all of our participation, our participants um, online. And I'm sorry that I wasn't able to get to all of your questions. Um, I encourage you to join us next week. Uh, with Dr. Evan Adams and um, the office. And so this could be a ritual that we come together um, in this space to support each other in this work because um, you are all um, part of the solution and doing such, um, I, I wanna hold my hands up to all of you for doing the work that you're doing. I'd also like to share with you some of the sessions that are coming up. Um, so on Thursday, for those of you who are interested, we have a, a panel um, from UBC. It's called the Wet'suwet'en Virtual Teach-In. And it's um, in response to the Wet'suwet'en title and right defenders and supporters. It's a place to hear about the history, the legal foundations and the media response um, to um, what has been happening in wet sweat and territory and there's amazing guests and it will be moderated by Cole Thrush, a professor and there are other professors that will be there. Um, welcome you to join us. It's at a time at 9.30. So it's earlier than our normal learning circles. We'll be streaming that. And of course, next Tuesday, our wellness series with um, Dr. Evan Adams. And then on the Thursday, April 16th, we have um, Harley Eagle joining us. And the session is called Cultural Safety in the Face of a Pandemic, Historic and Contemporary Realities Through a Trauma-Informed Lens. That looks really interesting. And then Denise Finley will be joining us again um, on April 28th. It's been a while, so I'm looking forward to um, visiting with her. And her session is called um, gathering our medicine. 
And for those of you that need some wellness, of course, all the resources that we talked about today, but uh, we also have a UBC um, Learning Circle channel on YouTube. There's a huge resource of Indigenous knowledges there um, and focused and some wellness activities for some of you and some beautiful stories um, to watch or binge watch um, whenever you want. So um, hi Chapka, once again, all of you stay well and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.